What uh, the New Century Foundation does, that's the nonprofit organization of which I'm president, we are committed to the idea of uh, establishing the moral foundations for advocacy for white people as a group. Uh, that sounds shocking to most uh, Americans, but uh, it's clear that racial identification is a part of uh, the identities of most people, certainly of non-white people. And it's only whites who have trained themselves to assume that they have no racial identity and that to express any kind of interest in the destiny of whites as whites is somehow immoral. We believe that not only is it not immoral, but that it is essential to the survival of whites as a distinct people. And so for more than 25 years now, a New Century Foundation has been endeavoring to establish the moral bases for a consciousness of whites as whites. Culture certainly is ever-changing, but I believe human nature is not. Human nature is essentially tribal. We spent many, many millennia evolving in small groups. And I think there are simply limits to the natural sense of solidarity and loyalty that human beings are capable of. Many Western people talk about being world citizens. By the way, you don't find many Africans or Asians claiming to be world citizens. I think that's something that may be an ideal, but it's an impossible ideal. Most people, I would say the huge majority of people, have parochial loyalties. That's part of our nature. Our first loyalty, of course, is to our families. And then people will have expanding circles of loyalty to their, to their language, to their religion, to their tribe, to their nation. And in the case of a mixed population like the United States, where you have people from many parts of the world, it seems to me that the obvious limit of a generalized sense of loyalty tends to be race. Race is in effect one's extended family. White people are more closely related genetically to all other white people than they are to people of any other race. And race is visibly apparent. Race also tends to be associated with certain kinds of behavior that people of the same race find attractive and comfortable. And so that's why, in my mind, the natural largest sense of solidarity that people tend to feel is that of race. Once you go beyond race, any kind of meaningful assimilation and solidarity becomes extremely difficult because I think that goes against our natural biological sense of kinship. We are loyal to our families because we are kin to our families. And I think there's this natural sense of loyalty to the people of our same race because they are biologically similar to us. I think that different racial groups, given that they have evolved differently over periods of tens of thousands of years, have drifted away from each other slightly, not simply in terms of physical appearance, but in terms of average personality, average inclination. And for that reason, I think that it becomes absolutely impossible to take Western civilization and try to plant it in Africa, for example. I just don't think that the genetic substrate in Africa is one that onto which my civilization can be planted. And if my civilization is to continue and to move forward, I think it can be own, maintained only by the people who are the physical heirs of the people who created that civilization. Wherever white people go, whether it's North America or Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, they tend to establish a, a nation with a certain texture a way of life, a way of doing things, based in, as I said before, the rule of law, freedom of speech, democratic representation, all of these things are surprisingly consistent. And uh, this is something that other races have had a very hard time struggling with. Africans, um, 
it seems harsh to say so, but every opportunity that they have had to accept a higher level of civilization and sophistication, for the most part it hasn't worked. Wherever you find African populations, whether in North America, whether in Israel, whether in Britain, you always find the same pattern of high crime rates, high illegitimacy, high poverty. I'm sorry to say this, but I think that is simply a reflection of the way the different populations have evolved. In the United States, up until 1965, we have consistently had an immigration policy that was designed to maintain a European majority population. Ever since the very first naturalization law in 1790, that was always the purpose. The very first Congress of the United States, after this country was established as an independent entity, meeting in 1790, one of the important things it had to decide was who will be American. And naturalization was limited to free white persons of good character. And this basic thinking, with certain modifications here and there, continued clear up until 1965. It was in that year that a new immigration law was passed. This was at a time during the American Civil Rights Movement in which rights were being granted to blacks that had been denied to them in the past. And at the same time, it was in the midst of the Cold War. The United States found it difficult to compete with the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union could say to all of these third world countries, you think capitalism and America are good? Look, they won't even let you immigrate. And so for these two reasons, this notion of overcoming racism and also to compete with the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of third world people, we made this change in our immigration laws. However, at that time, the change was advertised by its promoters as largely symbolic. It turned out not to be symbolic at all. And I think that if it were known that in a period of just 100 years, the United States would go from being 90% white to just 30% white. That's what's projected for 2060 with a majority of Hispanics. I suspect not a single congressman or senator would have voted for a law that was going to put that kind of change in motion. In any case, historically, the United States has taken for granted that it was a European country with a European destiny and heritage. And it was only in 1965 that we jumped the tracks, and not in a way that was deliberate. It was a way that was sold as a kind of window dressing, a symbolic change. These demographic transformations are happening almost exclusively in white countries. You don't find the Japanese letting in large numbers of foreigners, nor do you find Nigerians or Mexicans or anyone else, because this is happening in white countries. It is whites who face the prospect of being reduced to some kind of impotent minority, even in their own homelands. So for those two reasons, Reasons. To me, it is very important to establish some kind of territory in which certainly whites and, of course, all other people can maintain a majority in which their culture and their destiny will flourish. That, to me, is the ideal solution. That, in fact, at the same time, is, to me, real diversity. What's called diversity in the United States is bringing yet more people from all around the world and trying to mix up their various ideas. And yet, when people come from India, after two generations, are they really Indians? Their Indianness has been lost to some degree. But have they become Americans? Are they really descendants spiritually or physically of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson? They're not that either. You end up with this kind of strange, crazy mishmash that isn't really anything. Whereas Indians in India, Taiwanese in Taiwan, Chinese in China, they can maintain a real culture, a real integrity. And I think that too is very important. I'm a great believer in true diversity, but true diversity can flourish only when there's not this constant mixing and churning of all of these different cultures and different origins. Well, you've raised the, the question of uh, intermarriage. Um, it's interesting to me that despite an enormous propaganda in favor of intermarriage, that there's in fact not that much of it. 
perhaps uh, 10% of marriages in the United States cross racial lines, and for whites, it's considerably fewer, perhaps 4 or 5%. Um, I think that uh, the reality that persists despite the propaganda reflects just the natural preference people have for people like themselves. I think it is natural for white people to wish their children to be white. I think that parents are delighted to see their own traits, their own characteristics in their children. As a matter of fact, uh, I've read a number of heartbreaking commentaries written by white women who married, uh, in one case, an Indian man, a dark-skinned Indian man, and in another case, a black person. And they were almost shocked to discover that their children had, such, had features that seemed so alien to them, that when it came to choosing a husband or choosing a lover, it was one thing. And yet, when it was issue of their own loins, it was a shock to find someone, to see someone who was just so different. I think that's a na it's naturally shocking to people. At the same time, many studies have found that people of mixed race do have troubles of identification. In the United States, uh, it was traditional to talk about the tragic mulatto, who was accepted neither among blacks nor among whites. That's now considered to just be an old wives' tale. But many psychological studies have found that people who are of mixed race have a harder time adjusting, have a harder time making friends, tend to have more psychological difficulties. I think that uh, left to themselves, people are not likely to marry across racial lines. If that's what they wish to do, I would not forbid it. But in a healthy society that is homogeneous, this would be a very unlikely occurrence. Finally, miscegenation is a particular threat to whites because there are vast homelands of Chinese, for example, Asians, where there are no people of other races, there is no miscegenation there, of Africans, where there are no other people, no miscegenation. It is only whites who will eventually become this, this cafe au lait society that some people describe as the happy ending. So it is ultimately only whites who are likely to disappear through miscegenation, not any other group. Besides which, it's clear to me that miscegenation and the eventual disappearance of whites would not result in complete happiness and hand-holding across the board. Because even among blacks, you have continuing tension between lighter-skinned blacks, darker-skinned blacks, and you have Hispanics, some of whom are from Mexico, some of whom are from El Salvador who don't get along. We are tribal by nature. That tribal nature will not go away. And if in an attempt to combat our tribal nature, it means that whites disappear, I think that would be a terrible tragedy. After all, we care a great deal about the preservation of what are relatively insignificant species. The snail darter or uh, the spotted owl. I happen to like spotted owls. But the red squirrel as opposed to the gray squirrel. There's a real concern that the red squirrel is being displaced by the gray squirrel. I like red squirrels too, but what is wrong with wanting to preserve the, the light eyes, the blonde hair, the characteristics of Caucasians? I think that is as important, more important, strictly from an aesthetic point of view, than the preservation of the red squirrel or the, or the snail darter. And to cavalierly dismiss any kind of concern about the preservation of this group of human beings who have been evolving separately for probably 40,000 years to achieve the characteristics they've achieved, to dismiss this as some sort of bigotry or some sort of utterly unimportant thing, whereas preserving some sort of endangered spider is an important thing, again, this strikes me as a preposterous contradiction. You will never, ever see any mainstream condemnation of the idea of, of interracial marriage. You'll never, ever hear, hear anyone publicly say, I don't think that's a good idea. Never. You could live in the United States and uh, watch television, read newspapers 24 hours a day and never sleeping. You would never find anyone who says, I don't want this for my children. If any cabinet member 
a white cabinet member were to say, well, I hope my grandchildren look like my grandparents. I don't want them to look like Fu Manchu or Whoopi Goldberg. I want them to be white people. That would be the end of his political career. Finished. That would be utterly unacceptable. And yet, uh, we are the ardent supporters of a nation that practices a completely opposite policy. I think uh, in, in the case of this remarkable double standard of supporting uh, essentially uh, an ethno state in Israel, but a multicultural mixing pot in the United States, why does no one dare call that out as a contradiction? Yes, the, the question of Israel as a Jewish state. Not only Israel as a Jewish state, but one that is supported by the United States strikes me as an astonishing contradiction in terms. An Amer American president after president, American secretary of state after secretary of state, talks about the importance of maintaining a Jewish state of Israel. And yet, they don't seem to have the slightest notion that the immigration policies of Israel or the population policies of Israel are in complete contradiction with the ones that they proclaim to the United States. As I recall, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, not too long before he was assassinated, he said that he had done many things that he thought were good for Israel, but what he cared about most was that Israel remained at least 80% Jewish. And his assumption was that if Israel ceased to be majority Jewish, it would change in ways that would make it one in which his descendants would no longer feel comfortable. Now, people take this absolutely at face value. They see absolutely nothing wrong with this. But if an American politician were to say, what I care about most in my policies is to maintain a United States that's at least 80% white, that would be considered hate-mongering. That would be considered Nazism. And yet, uh, frankly, I don't see the difference. It is an understanding that as populations change, everything else changes. Israel cannot be a Jewish state without a Jewish population. That, that's obvious. To me, the United States cannot be part of Western civilization without a population that's Western. So when Americans American politicians, many of whom are wildly liberal in terms, of in terms of domestic policy, support a Jewish Israel. I would love to ask them to explain this contradiction. I've never had the opportunity, but I would love to. I think that uh, race is something that is ordinarily so powerful that it can dissolve differences in language and religion. Not always, but I think that people, so long as they share the same race, eventually over time they can establish a sense of community and fellow feeling, even if there are differences of religion, differences of language. And so I think that uh, uh, Jewish Americans, there's certainly nothing wrong with their being Jewish and having a religion that is different from the majority Christian religion. So long as they consider themselves men and women of the West and think of themselves as heirs not only to a Jewish tradition but to a European tradition, which is the case for most of the Jews who live in the United States. We have far more Ashkenazi Jews than Sephardim. I think they can certainly be part of the United States. And uh, for them, in particular, it is sometimes striking that they will be so strident about preserving a Jewish Israel, and yet many of them would line up as the most rabid multiculturalist when it comes to the United States. I think, uh, once again, this is a, a, very, a very striking double standard that neither American Jews nor American politicians are ever called to account on. But... Uh, uh, the question of religion for Israel, for example, one can be a Jew without being an observant Jew. One can be a Jew and be uh, orthodox. One can be a Jew and be completely atheist. This shows that the Jewishness is not something that is a matter of religion, but it's a matter of descent. 
And that, to me, shows how important it is, this, this sense of genetic kinship. That's basically what Israel is. It is a state of genetic kinship for people who have been Jews for thousands of years, and some, well, and it gives them an opportunity to live together and have a destiny that's explicitly Jewish. I think that's a wonderful thing. I only ask that uh, Europeans have the same right to have some place where they can be explicitly European. They can be French, they can be German, they can be American, but white people too deserve a homeland in which their destinies can unfold.